Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us wherever you are in the world. I'm honored to welcome you to the second session of our TDK Ventures Energy Week 2021 conference, covering topics related to energy transformation, or as we call it, EX. For those of you who joined us for the first session yesterday, welcome back. Next slide, please. My name is Mark Boucher. I'm an analyst with TDK Ventures, the corporate venture capital arm of the Japanese electronics giant TDK Corporation. We care deeply about energy transformation and have made 18 investments in deep tech companies in a little over two years, many in the energy, mobility, and materials science spaces, all relevant to energy transformation. I'll be moderating our session today. Like every other session in Energy Week, we designed our panel to comprise thought leaders representing academia, industry, entrepreneurs, and the investment community. We're excited to be bringing together diverse voices to help show, show us the way on technologies that will enable all of us to take meaningful action towards a more sustainable future in energy. Next slide, please. Today, I'm more than excited to introduce our amazing panelists, and I truly look forward to a stimulating and thought-provoking conversation with ample involvement from all of you, the audience, as well. Our first panelist is none other than Venka Vishwanathan, Associate Professor at Carnegie Mellon University and an expert in material design and energy storage with deep involvement across a number of startups. Our second panelist is Sue Babinek, Program Lead at Argonne National Lab, focusing on energy storage technologies. Sue has previously spent time as an advisor at ARPA-E and as a technical director at A123 Systems. Our third panelist is Chi Chao Hu, founder and CEO of SES, a world leading startup developing high performance lithium metal batteries. Before SES, Chi Chao spent time as a researcher at MIT. Our fourth panelist is Dania Gantus, VP of Technology at Qnovo, where she has developed and commercialized BMS and fast charging algorithms deployed to millions of devices. Our fifth panelist is AK Shruji. CTO of Romeo Power. His time at Romeo Power has taken him through R&D and cell technology, and before that, he was working on physical chemical battery models at Bosch in Silicon Valley. Our sixth panelist is Mark Vandenberg, founder of MV MVDB Advisors and a clean tech veteran. He spent time in industry as well as advising numerous energy and deep tech startups and was previously with DBL Partners. Our seventh and finalist, final and certainly not least panelist is none other than Tal Schulklapper, co-founder and CEO of Voltaic. Prior to Voltaic, Tal worked on an ARPA-E funded project developing ultra low cost grid scale batteries. He was also a co-founder of a fuel cell startup, Point Source Power. Clearly we have a lot of firepower on this panel today. Uh, more than excited to be getting into discussion with everyone involved. Uh, and already in advance, a huge thank you to all of these uh, great guests for joining us. Next slide, please. So uh, for those who maybe are not familiar with the format, perhaps you didn't join us yesterday, I'll review the agenda for today, which will start with me giving a few opening remarks. Uh, I hope to keep it as short as possible. And then we'll move on to a discussion around two key questions. Uh, these will be very, fairly open-ended questions engaging uh, our, our panel, uh, talking about the future of technologies in this space uh, in the uh, battery uh, management system, battery modeling, and battery data realm. Uh, then we will have a moment to pull the audience. So this will be a time for you to get involved. Uh, as an audience member, please do be ready with either a cell phone to scan a QR code or with an open tab on your web browser to uh, respond to the answers that our panels, our panelists provide. Finally, we'll be opening up to an open Q&A session at the end from the audience, where you'll be able, as an audience member, to ask a question in the comment section, uh, and we'll try and get to those with our panelists. Next slide, please. So to give a quick overview of the topic for today, we'll be discussing, as I mentioned, battery management systems, battery modeling, and battery data. Uh, obviously, the, these topic areas span a pretty wide breadth. Uh, we're coming at it from the angle of seeing uh, BMS systems and hardware sensing technologies. We're seeing AI and ML analytics applied to battery degradation and battery performance prediction. We've also seen cloud software uh, as far as battery fleet management. Uh, and then mentioning fleets, there's obviously a number of uh, fleet data needs. 
And then we'll also maybe even touch on end of life tracking and kind of trying to build a more circular uh, battery ecosystem using battery data uh, and battery performance information. Um, obviously, I, I'm certainly compared to our panel, not an expert in these realms. So I really hope to get their, their interesting insights and in where the space is going. Next slide, please. So now, uh, before we kick off today's energetic discussion, a final reminder on how this forum will go. We'll be focusing our discussion of battery management systems, battery modeling, and battery data around two key guiding questions. The first discussion will be focused on the most impactful innovation in battery management systems, battery modeling, and battery data that will be realized in the next five years. So focus on the shorter and near-term innovations. The second discussion will be focused on the most challenging innovation that can disrupt the market in the next 10 years. So we'll be looking further afield for some innovations that our guests think are most impactful. Our hope is to have a diverse opinions, uh, maybe even contrary, contrarian views, and we'll aim to uncover whatever cutting edge technologies, trends, and business models that the energy industry should be paying attention to. The answers from our panelists should power the initial discussion. We will then shift gears and have an opportunity for you, the audience, to get involved. The first way to do this will be with your votes on the answers provided by our panelists. Be sure again to have a phone or browser ready to vote. And then we'll be going on to an open Q&A session, as I mentioned. So let's get started. Uh, for our panelists, please see the link in the chat on the right-hand side of your screen. And if we can move to the next slide as well. Panelists, please see the link on the right-hand side of your screen. Click through to submit answers that you think uh, respond to the, what the most meaningful innovation to be realized in the next five years in this space is. And we'll be off to the races uh, with a great discussion. Okay, it looks like we already have one answer. Enterprise battery intelligence, cradle to grave. That'll be pretty fascinating. We see open data sharing. Uh, we have a little under a minute left, accurate lifetime predictions coupled with methods. Um, battery digital twins. I can see there's kind of a software approach here on the, the kind of perhaps some SaaS plays. AI guided new battery chemistry optimization. Excellent, excellent. I think. Uh, we can maybe get, a, I think we're waiting on one more answer here potentially. Oh, we got a long one. The innovation that has not been funded, current lack of experience, risk capital in the market. That's a good one. I think uh, we can have a discussion around funding deep tech innovations and funding battery innovations. I'm sure that'll be great. Um, wonderful. I think we have seven answers. So even though we have a little bit of time left on the poll, perhaps we can move right into the chat. Um, Everyone's getting pulled in here. Hey, Venka. Hey, Mark. Great. So kicking this off, uh, maybe we can uh, discuss, I guess, let's start with maybe the, the foundation, right? So, so um, using batteries, uh, sorry, um, accurate lifetime prediction coupled with methods, I think was a really interesting place to start. So understanding how long batteries will last uh, and, and maybe we can help our audience understand what underpins some of that. And Danya, if you want to maybe kick us off with, uh, you know, how you've experienced this at Qnovo and what your take is on accurate battery lifetime prediction. Oh, OK, um, so, you know, when um, when when you look at materials, batteries are going to degrade and it's important to be able to understand how a battery degrades. It's going to degrade under different conditions, it's going to degrade because of different um, parameters. So it becomes important to be able to measure exactly what that battery is doing and then be able to look at, you know, be able to use models to determine how the battery is degrading and why it's degrading. And then be able to predict exactly where that battery is going. Um, uh, and that gives you a look into the future in terms of how that battery is degrading. Um, and then from there, you can go back and then you can modify the charging parameters so you can c continuously manage that battery as it's being used. And so, you know, we've implemented um, battery intelligence and, and our, our uh, intelligent algorithms into our first market has been into the smartphone space. And so where we've shipped over 150 million smartphones across you know, um, the different battery families. And, and then we use that data then to go back and then um, kind of teach our models and improve our models. Because, you know, in batteries, you're always gonna have variation from, from um, one process. I, I mean, from a lot to lot, you've got cell to cell variation, you've got manufacturing variations, you've got defects. 
manufacturing defects. Um, so it becomes important to be able to use battery intelligence as a way to kind of productize new markets. Um, materials innovation by itself is not sufficient because you constantly have to, um, you're constantly uh, optimizing for performance and cost and safety. And so you need to uh, add battery, in, uh, battery intelligence to it in order to be able to kind of improve the materials. Mm. You know, materials, we've seen a lot of great um, materials coming out of the lab. We've seen a lot of great results, but these have to scale and it's a long process and it takes a lot of time. You know, it's expensive and it can be prone to safety. So adding a layer of intelligence onto that can really help productize the new materials. So you can improve safety, you can improve performance, and then it's cost effective because you can do this in software. Sure. Um, in, a, in addition to that, you know, there, there's the whole safety area, which, you know, we don't talk enough about it. It's only when it's headline news, then we, you know, we spend more time on it. But the, the reality is battery defects are going to happen and they're real and they're going to be part of life. And so you have to add a layer of intelligence mm -hmm. over it onto that so you can be able to predict where your faults are. Um, you know, battery manufacturers can't screen for every single defect. They just can't. Um, some cannot be screened for. And, you know, the recent headlines um, from the Bolt and the Kona just show that, you know, cells were shipped with defects in them. And it was only later on that these latent defects became catastrophic. So it becomes important to be able to manage that. So now you can improve you know, where we are today to where we're heading, especially with the volumes of um, EVs that are predicted. So um, battery intelligence adds that layer of intelligence. Um, it can use advanced models, you can use big data um, and data science to be able to predict where the faulty cells are. So instead of having a massive recall, then you can just reduce it down to a service call or to a, um, a, or to a repair, which is much, much cheaper than having to do a massive recall. Sure. I think I'd be I'd be curious to also learn more in the next five years um, from Tal's point of view with what you're doing at Voltaic, um, more kind of on the software side. I, I think hopefully we can get to the battery materials innovation and and how some of this plays into it. But from from Voltaic's perspective and and from your perspective on on kind of software to to enable battery safety, I guess what would your response be? Sure. Um... And thank you, Mark and Daniel, build off of uh, your initial discussion here. Um, and really happy to see that battery intelligence has become resonant in the, the industry here as a, as a concept. Um, so what we see is the need here for really an end-to-end -end enterprise wide, uh, you know, solution for cradle to grave analytics around these batteries. You know, once they're already in the field, it's often too late when you catch some of these issues. And so it's really important to understand the incoming materials, the manufacturing processes, and then track these systems uh, end to end. I think the big thing we're seeing right now is there's a lot of these initial proof points around the value of battery data within smaller silos and smaller data sets. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we have continuous and constant change in the underlying chemistries uh, and almost exponential, you know, outgrowth of the different ways these batteries can fail in, you know, defects upstream, you know. Folds and tears are one thing, but you know it could be particles going in there. It could be you know densities within these electrodes. Uh, you know it's almost you know infinite the different possibilities here. Uh, we're still in the early days, and so really building that kind of infrastructure to be able to catch these problems, uh, not just in the field. Uh, we're we're seeing bad battery cells. We're being seeing bad battery packs actually from day zero before they actually get in the customer's hands. And so it's important to actually have that analytical infrastructure to address these things as soon as you can and then remediate as quickly as you can as well once you do uh, observe them. Sure. sure. I see Venkat nodding his head. Uh, is there something that resonated there for what you're hearing from Tal? Yeah, I, I think the, the point that Tal made that, uh, you know, by the time uh, it's already, you know, in the car, uh, you know, it's a lost cause, right? I think that to be able to detect and, and solve it at that point. So I think the... The, the cradle to grave idea is is really uh, really important, and I just want to sort of set the context for why this is difficult, right? Uh, uh, you know, there are lots of devices that are there, and you know we understand and, and manage assets over long periods of time. 
But batteries are special in the following way, right? So if the, the devices we typically interact with, like the display that uh, that we're using to to see this, uh, or uh, you know, or other kinds of um, you know uh, devices like solar cells and things like that. In all of those devices, you're essentially moving massless particles. You're either moving electrons or photons. Batteries is the only device where you're actually moving atoms, right? So every every cycle, a lithium atom is waking up from the anode and going to the cathode to discharge, and then when you charge, you move it back, right? So you're actually moving uh, a mass mass object, right? And so that makes it very difficult. Uh, and of course, that means that there are many, many different ways of failing, right? And so uh, uh, to be able to catch the new failure modes as you were uh, thinking about battery innovation, right? I think uh, across the arc, right? Only from material innovation all the way to degradation, uh, I think it's very important. And the second challenge for predicting degradation is batteries are closed systems, which is the great thing about batteries and the biggest challenge with batteries, right? You cannot look inside. Right, and so because of that, you don't, you can't actually diagnose these failures easily, uh, and so I think that the, the sort of two points that uh, you know Carl and and Danya mentioned, uh, you know, resonate deeply with me. That you know, I think this is the way of the future in terms of being able to pair um, data and analytics all the way from early innovation uh, to product deployment. Super, neat. yeah, and I'd be curious also. Um, AK, from your perspective, making full up battery systems, how are you implementing some of this like end to end battery intelligence in, into how you're building your devices and your systems? Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. And I'll use the, um, some cues from uh, Venkat's uh, comments and description, right? So we've established that those various systems are highly, highly, highly nonlinear, right? They're aging at rest, they're aging during cycling. And they age differently but, uh, without any, with a lot of, sorry, historical dependence on, on how they've been used. So it's, it's, it's very important for us to predict that since we've talked about accurate lifetime prediction. Um, so there's two facets to this, right? We're looking at employing uh, onboard models that get supported with cloud-based models. Uh, because there's a limit to how much computational power you want to put on your actual battery system because that affects cost. However, there's also value in having redundancy as well as um, advanced methods that uh, pull uh, real field data to complement the, the onboard estimations. And um, additionally, on another aspect, aside from really relying on a lot of math with the baseline of data available from the system we're looking at advanced sensing methods and one of the areas we've identified as truly critical and differentiating to be able to start looking inside the battery like ben Katt said uh, from our side we've selected rapid electrochemical impedance spectroscopy so there's been a few key innovations that take uh, rapid impedance spectroscopy from the traditional 30 minute um, laboratory experiment but on a single cell to a novel type of system that can do high voltage rapid electrochemical impedance spectroscopy within 10 seconds and so that breakthrough uh, enables us to uh, move into a, an application uh, on board a, a battery system and on board a vehicle so we think for us as we've selected a, a partnership that we've publicly announced with the dynexis uh, that is going to be key to give us uh, more of that uh, look inside the battery uh, instead of relying heavily on um, or be too, too much prediction bias. Uh, the other thing I would say, why lifetime prediction is very, very important. Uh, we're at the forefront of possibly new um, financial models around batteries. Batteries are becoming more connected. We're moving towards vehicle to grid integration. <laughs> So if I have a 10% error on my health estimation and lifetime prediction compared to 5% or maybe 1%, it means I can predict and assess differently the value in this battery from a financial point of view. And the more precise I estimate this, the more accurate my financial models are going to be. And to be specific, what we're talking about is unlocking uh, more energy as service type models uh, where battery cost is recovered through time and not upfront. And this is where, you know, technology, battery modeling, data analytics, even machine learning 
advanced sensing is being utilized today uh, to create new business model and financial systems all around the battery. Yeah. I think uh, it'll be. I'd be interested to interested to hear if that's in the five year time frame or the ten year time frame. Maybe we can uh, just. An, do you have a quick thought on whether you see those models, those business models, and kind of value capture models evolving more rapidly within five years, or is it still further further afoot in the future? Yeah, that's a great point. I think maybe the few items that I've described they would be tiered towards maybe the ten years. So on the on, on, on starting to um, you know integrate the advanced sensing methodology uh, we see that within five years right mm -hmm. uh, we've already demonstrated that at cell and module level we're working on the miniaturization to integrate that into a battery system so that's more on the actual practical steps you need to take and partially that will happen in five years and there's a lot of ramifications now all the way to uh a full full blown financial model being the new standard yeah that may take way more time but i do expect some pilot programs on the finance side to occur within the five years for sure for sure um sue i'd be curious in hearing your thoughts i think venkat talked about a black box uh around mm -hmm. you know the material models <clears throat> i know you mentioned you mm -hmm. have some expertise in the ml side of things um i'd be just interested in hearing your take in the next five years where does that modeling sure. and ml side of things go Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Happy to talk about this. Um, first, let me just echo that everything my colleagues have said so far completely agree with. And when I was asked to choose what it, do I believe is the most important um, component, I chose open data sharing. And let me explain why I did that. Where we are today is that we know that these these processes and these models work. And we have people to thank like Tal, who is a tremendous leader in this area. And of course, uh, Ben Kett as well, and Romeo. This is all like super important. But as we go from like the demonstration to this absolutely completely mature approach for AI and machine learning, what we know is that for this to get there is that we need more data, okay? So the, and what I call the data algorithm journey, the, the, qual the, the quality of the algorithm reflects not only the capabilities of the data scientists and the electrochemists to handle the data, but also the absolute amount of data. And we've seen this over and over again, whether it's the fact that we can now recognize cats versus a dog in a picture or the human data genome this the amount of data that we need is really foundational for all of these to accelerate and reach the maturity that they need to have and that they will have at this point so and i'm i'm a person who is now for the first time in my life at a national lab and i can see that um the the power of having very great computational power and is as well the amount of data that we can handle so that's like what we need to do now there's two complexities here in order for this to happen one is that we need to have some standardization of the metadata and the acquisition and cleaning up of data before we do that that's pretty linear and that's hard work and it needs to be done it's not it's complicated but it's not really complex and the next one as we go to this paradigm here is that we have to have some sort of a win-win and agreed upon approach for different types of sharing. Certainly not all the data needs to be open, but we need to have a mix as we do in other industries. And so that, um, and then protocols to make sure that this happens. So again, in, in summary, everything that's happened so far makes sense, but the common wall that we're gonna butt up against is to really take it to maturity. We need to have some sort of open sharing and that's been done in other industries and that's what i'm looking forward to it'll make it better for everyone i think i think this is we can look forward to i'd be curious to hear uh Chichao, you know developing new battery technology you're i imagine you're collecting a lot of data i imagine not all of it is stuff that you want to share but how do you envision the open data sharing needed for the whole battery field to progress 
Yeah, I think uh, in terms of uh, data, uh, especially in the, the battery industry, I think one thing we need to establish a, a, um, a rigorous standard because now you, you see a lot of data uh, published by different companies, different research labs, but then it's very confusing. Sometimes um, people use one battery that's optimized for one thing and then, and then totally different designs for um, different tests. So I think you, you have to have for example, one battery, one design, and then you use that uh, to run basic tests, energy density, performance, safety, just the basic stuff. And then that has to be rigorous. Um, so I think the industry um, could benefit a lot from a rigorous standard, um, not just because otherwise everyone is going to say we have we have high energy density <laughs> uh, because it's uh, calculated, but all that stuff. And then also going back uh, to the uh, to the battery health, I think on that one, it is also quite interesting. The, the battery health is actually similar to a person's health. Uh, your health is dependent on uh, partially your gene, DNA, before you were born, and <laughs> also your lifestyle, your uh, nutrition, exercise. And then same thing with batteries. And uh, one thing that we, we do, because we actually uh, make batteries and also um, we've seen uh, some of the Korean and the Chinese mm -hmm. battery companies start to do is uh, while they are manufacturing, they implement a massive amount of sensors. For example, you, you make, um, and, uh, and this is important because today, um, the industry doesn't really do that at a scale. So uh, better quality issues comes down to probability statistics. So say out of a million, you have 20 or 10 or six cells that'll have issues. But we really have to get to a point where say you make hundreds of thousands of cells and then cell number 75,821, that number, and then you go way back to all the materials, the electrolyte coming in, what's the moisture content, what's the chloride content, all the impurities, cathodes, what's the thickness, uniformity, and then separators. You basically track all the detailed quality uh, of all the incoming control, the, the incoming quality control, and the manufacturing process. If you stack it, every cell you take a scan, CT or X-ray, and then um, if the margin, for example, is one millimeter, okay, that's 800 cycles. If the margin is half a millimeter, that's 500 cycles. That's a difference of 300 cycles. All these details, and then you measure impedance, you just collect a massive amount of data on every material, every step of the entire process, and then that's that's like the, the, the DNA, the health before the, the battery is born. And once the battery is born, uh, formation data, and also once the battery is is uh, installed inside a car, for example, we are now working with a GM and a Hyundai. We're trying to collect this data. Different people, some people will like to drive the car fast, some people drive it slow, some people charge it slowly when they sleep, some people like to use the fast charging more often, some people charge outdoors, it's very cold, some people charge inside the garage, it's warm. All these like, like a environment, like the batteries, uh, lifestyle uh, combined with the manufacturing quality control, all that data, you put all that together into this uh, digital twin, if you will, and then use that to to predict um, um, uh, incidents. Um, hopefully, we're trying to get to, for example, five cycles, 10 cycles before something really bad happens so that you can address the safety. Um, because once you have a, a, a fire, incident, then you have recalls, then it's one, it's, it's, it's hugely expensive. And also too, it's, um, it's um, uh, bad for, for people's health. So. Definitely, uh, almost coming full circle to what Daniel mentioned at the beginning, it's, uh, you know, some of these recalls are really, really yeah. damaging and, and unfortunate. I think I'd love to get Mark Vandenberg's perspective. We're talking about innovation across a lot of different areas of the kind of the, the battery value chain, the lifespan of the battery. Um, in the next five years, from your point of view on the investment side, um, where do you see, like, which aspect do you see most exciting? Uh, thanks, Mark. And, and I was going to, you know, try to actually compete with this group of esteemed panelists on some actually core tech innovation that I might predict and figured I better stick to my knitting. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I highlighted that I think that the capital markets specifically in private equity and venture are a little bit out of balance. Um, 
lack of investing by experienced investors in early and mid-stage companies. And I think what what we could reflect on or what I've reflected on is many of us remember uh, the Cleantech 1.0 investing euphoria that occurred 15, 16 years ago. We launched uh, thousands of companies between energy production, energy storage, clean tech, as you will. And electrochemistry investing is really freaking hard. And uh, whether it's because we're moving a mass or a battery is just like a big pile of goo that degrades every time you use it. Um, for me, it always was an experience with uh, Silo Nano and Amprius and Tesla and Vionics and other things that I did where you had to sort of spend very patient amount of time, seven to 10 years, 70 to $100 million to actually turn enough cards over to know whether you should start doubling down on that opportunity. And out of that Cleantech 1.0 era, what we found was a lot of things kind of went by the wayside. Standard venture capital, right? Launch a thousand ships, only a couple hundred maybe get to the other side of the shore. What we found then is Cleantech 1.0 turned into Climate Tech 1.0 and a massive amount of capital rolled into the sector looking for public opportunities, not finding them. And so a bunch of capital got accumulated by a smaller group of companies. And what got left by the, by the, by the wayside, I think, is the early stage endeavors, whether it be from Soup's lab at Argonne or from CMU, MIT, other things where we need to be ensuring that we have a very harmonious amount of private equity and venture going into all the stages for product development. And it could be things that are highlighted on this panel. It could be things that are sort of new and innovative in the minds of scientists and other entrepreneurs that are just not getting enough capital to take their businesses to the next level. So that was my that was my reason for the um, my vote, Mark. So thanks. Awesome. No, definitely. I, I saw Sue nodding uh, a little bit towards the beginning, talking about some of the investing in electrochemistry is tricky business and working on this. This technology can be. Uh, <laughs> You know, multivariate. So, and <laughs> I think you might have a few things to say. Actually, believe it or not, I don't. I just was vehemently agreeing with him. <laughs> so awesome. it wasn't. I was just mostly nodding. But I did want to just briefly mention uh, on the SES comment. Uh, um, we, we need to be careful. We need to clarify when we talk about machine learning and AI. What the objective is there? If it sounds like there was a lot of there's been a lot of work done on using AI and machine learning on a single battery design to try to like be able to detect manufacturing issues and I think that's what he was speaking about but I did want to say that once cells are manufactured you don't need to have a single design in order to you to do the AI and the machine learning and in fact at Argon we just finished a study where we deliberately were able to get excellent predictive quality and algorithms that went across six different chemistries and like four or five designs. So we just need, as we go forward, we need to be um, careful about what we're discussing. And then my, my uh, discussions were very much about life prediction and connecting life separately to formation. And uh, just to, to drill into that a little bit, is that coming from more flexible material models that you're able to use to understand how the actual core electrochemistry is happening and that ports across different different real life chemistries or to be so flexible, can, where is that yeah. coming from? If I can just uh, uh, um, jump in, so so Please I do. agree. Yes. Um, if we have, so once you have cells, you can have different chemistries, different cathodes, anodes, combination, and then you can still, uh, apply the model, uh, but um, our perspective was once you have the the actual cells and then say in a vehicle, you could have several hundred of the larger, say 100 amp power cells or several thousand of the smaller cells. And then that cell, of course, there's the electrochemistry part, but also the mechanical part. Mm -hmm. So that particular cell, yes, the, the chemistry, say it's a high nickel paired with some type of silicon, and then you can model that. But then that cell will also have might have some mechanical issues. Maybe the 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 stacking has some some misalignment. The welding wasn't so good. So it's like trying to combine the mechanical issues of that particular cell with the actual chemical issues of that particular cell. Hmm. And so, 
And so my comment would be that if you look at a list, if you use the electrochemical rigor that everyone here, of course, knows is like there's like six different failure modes. You were mentioning those modes. All those modes together produce one signal in the curve that you get when you cycle a battery. Okay. So they all, they all participate at different levels and to different extents in the various failure modes. And those all together in harmony create one signal that you have in the cell. So I'm, I, I believe I'm agreeing with you. All I'm saying is, is that you can throw everything into the pot and you can still get a rugged sort of general use algorithm that does not have to be chemistry specific. Yeah, and if I could jump in, I think, you know, I agree generally that, you know, you need to have an infrastructure for managing and analyzing this data. I think the concern right now, for me, at least looking at the space is, there's a push right now to say, you know, we solve this, we have an algorithm that can catch problems, we have an algorithm that can make lifetime predictions, but we're seeing in practice, you know, that those algorithms aren't able to catch the fires, they aren't accurately predicting the life of these battery systems. And uh, it's almost a, you know, early jump, you know, based on small sets of data that we're seeing people um, sort of over extrapolate to. And, you know, it's really that the infrastructure is key to deal with that continuous, you know, variability across all these yeah. devices, the continuous yeah. change right. in the supply chain yeah. and trying to push yeah. it all out. A lot of the electrochemical models that we have seen kind of assume the perfect mechanical system. Just mechanically, the cell is perfect. Um, but then in reality, it's never perfect. And all the cells will always have just just different just uh, different offsets, margins. And then um, if everything is the same, OK, it should give you 800 cycles. But then all these mechanical issues um, uh, do actually sometimes overshadow the electrochemical signals. I think at the, at the heart, there is an underlying assumption we're making, right, with accelerated uh, life testing to be able to extrapolate the conditions that we don't know, right? The only way to do an eight-year life test is to wait eight years, right? We cannot wait eight years, right? So, yeah. so I think that's the fundamental challenge here. And, and I think this is where I think we need to do better, right? If you look at sort of the field of fluid mechanics, right? They do scaled models, right? They bring the size down and, and do the tests on wind tunnels and, and then scale it to large. Obviously, they don't build the plane, right? But they build a scaled version of the plane through, you know, through the right scaling, right? The Reynolds number scaling and things like that. In the same way, I think we don't have as good of a principle to be able to identify and tease out these different failure modes in these accelerated stress tests, right? I think as Sue mentioned, right? Ultimately, if you're just looking at voltage and current signals and being able to use that to tease out degradation mechanisms, I, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really, really uh, challenging task uh, because it's a highly convoluted uh, signal that you cannot tease out this is happening, that's happening. And even when we do accelerated testing, we activate new failure modes, right? And maybe not the right failure modes that, that happen in practice, right? And I think, I think here is where the disconnect and I think identifying different uh, you know, better accelerated aging uh, tests uh, unique to chemistry or unique to materials. Uh, and of course, logging that and sort of translating that on the field as it's sort of evolving is pretty critical. So, and let me just add to that what Venkat just said and then sort of embellish what Tal just said. It, it, this all depends on what you are focusing on because we're in this first generation where this pretty much works. And if I say I can look at all these different chemistries and I can get a projection within plus or minus 70 cycles out to 2,500 cycles. That's different than what Tal was speaking about, for example. If, because if you're looking at an average prediction and how good is your algorithm at doing that, that is different than trying to say, for manufacturing, I need to be able to sniff out where the outliers are or where is the safety issue going to occur. And if you're doing that, then the nature of the data set that you have and the metadata that you have there, I think is different. So again, we have to always keep in mind what is the objective that we're looking for. And my comment was a sort of an all purpose, we can evaluate what is the average lifetime going to be, not where is there a safety issue or where was there a manufacturing defect. And in that case, then you go back to the SES comment about, then, you, there, then your metadata actually is the data. Right, which is exactly how did you make that single design? 
so from a car company, the car company, basically that car has a couple hundred of the same cell, same chemistry, supposed to be the same chemistry, but all those cells will, will have different lifetime because they have different mechanical issues and then just variance in quality of the manufacturing. So from a car company perspective, we need to make sure that this car, say the Hummer EV, which has 300 of 100 amp hour cells, you can, and then if one cell fails, the car is as strong as the weakest cell, right? Um, and then and then try to build this model by taking all the manufacturing data, because that has the mechanical information of those cells, those 300 cells, and the actual chemical data, and also the usage, charge, discharge, and then put all that together. Tito, you, you you mentioned mechanics a lot, right? But what, and maybe this is to AK, right? But what yeah. mechanical data are you tracking real time? Because, uh, yeah, because actually, for example, if you look at the recalls, most of the recalls are due to mechanical failures, like welding, um, mm -hmm. um, stack alignment, all these things. For example, if you build a pouch cell stack, right? And then, of course, you have this like, this optimal range, say it's between 0.5 and one millimeter is the optimal. But then if you're 0.7 millimeter, you're 800 cycles. If you're 0.6, just off by a little bit. Um, so um, um, oh. alignment, all the electrical uniformity, a lot of mechanical Okay. Issues. So Chicho, so um, what you're saying is, is that your data in this prediction is like actual information coming off of the manufacturing equipment. Correct. Got Correct. It. Yes. Yes. There you go. Yeah. I get it now. Yeah. Sorry. To yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're trying to avoid Sorry. recalls because, sure, because sure, all sure. these all these big companies are yes. are yes. supposed to have really good quality system, mm -hmm. but still maybe ten out of a million, like fifteen out of a million have issues. So, and then all these recalls that cost millions of dollars is because of some silly mechanical issues, like welding has some spark, like yes. silly things. <laughs> And that's, and I, that's ultimately the key challenge here. These are yes. a lot of these are one yes. in a million, one in ten million yeah. issues, yeah. and unless you have the infrastructure to start looking for those, uh, you're not going to catch it in the lab or even you know at a commercial scale lab even. So it's just uh, you right. need to have the really connect the dots between that uh, upstream uh, data on the batteries, yep. you know, makeup and DNA, and then track it over life. So I think <laughs> I, I think that's a great place to maybe move in uh, to the next phase of our discussion. So so Tal, I think you wrapped this up nicely. It looks like in the next five years, we're looking at the data infrastructure, the data sharing to create the foundation that's needed for these mm -hmm. more accurate or more effective predictions. Um, and now we're going to shift gears into beyond five years, what do we feel the most challenging and disruptive innovation is in the ten, next 10 years? Um, so again, I'll ask you to use that link in the chat. That'll allow you to put a few answers in that we can then get another great conversation started on. Awesome. So we got another minute around here and uh, looking at 10 years from now, so a little further afield. Um, Hopefully we will have a world where there are no battery defects or battery problems, but end-to-end <laughs> -end robotic experimentation paired with ML to optimize batteries. It's a whole system approach. Optimize mobility around second law of thermodynamics and first law of thermodynamics. Uh, safe batteries that don't compromise on performance and range. Yep. Taking the fear out of battery with intelligent BMS. These are some great answers. In the 10 years, there are no most challenging innovations, ensuring the safety and predictability of battery powered systems. There's no magic algorithm or hardware. It's just, it sounds like it's just hard work. Um, we got time I for can't, one. I can't vote. It's not accepting mine uh -huh. somehow. Um, are we able to pause the time to give Sue a moment to, to click through? It just, it just says, please wait or ask the presenter to open voting. Perhaps I went to the wrong link. Um, if you look in the chat, you should have a new link. Uh, oh, a new one. Okay, that's my bad. Yep. Okay, okay. No. I went to the old one. There we go. I apologize. No okay. worries. And then we'll be, uh, we'll be an even seven of answers. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. <laughs> Plan second life batteries. Okay, I think we can get into more the life cycle, uh, full, full life cycle side of things in this next discussion. 
and uh, maybe we'll kick it off with a different format than we did last time. Um, if every, I'll, I'll go down the list on on my view, and everybody can kind of speak to the answer that they gave and, and give some context around it, and then I think we can kick off from there. So, Sue, uh, you know, can you just give us some more context on the answer you provided around the second life? Oh well, in terms of us, okay, let's see. Second life batteries. Well, I mean, I think this is this will be massively disruptive to the supply chain. Second life batteries right now, it's very it's very uh, nascent. There just really aren't that many batteries that are need to go uh, to somewhere else. And so right now, it's just an annoying one up situation. But before long, in eight years or so, when the massive upswing starts bringing us 80 percent batteries, we're going to need to handle this. And the, there's several technical challenges to it. Number one, the first one is to quickly assess the advanced state of health. And I don't mean a quick capacity check. I mean, I'm talking about like looking at the various resistances. And I think Romeo actually um, already had made a comment about it. So we've got to be able to do that. When it comes to these cells that we're talking about, even though the information is at the cell level, these things are modules and impacts. The second challenge that we have is to be able to isolate the cells and disable them without disassembling the whole module of PAC because that will just ruin the economics. And then the third one is trying to figure out where do these things go so you get the most economic value out of them in the lifetime. So those are the three challenges. I think the reason I think it's going to be a, a big deal is because there are going to be massive numbers of these and it's going to upset the apple cart in a very big way. I don't think that we're going to be able to just do sort of like a certified pre-owned battery. I think that the supply chain is going to be so disrupted that we're going to have to rethink ownership and business models. I cannot wait to get more into that. Thank you, Sue. So Mark, uh, give us a highlight on your answer as well. Sure. Um, so my my assumption, and it could be wrong, right? Because VCs are never right, um, was that all of the things that we talked about in the first section of the panel, we'd work our way through them. Those right, sensing and reliability and supply chain management, uh, optimization for both energy and power, packaging, interconnects, all those things would sort of be, you know, much more mature. And mobility for me was then going to be about you know, having General Motors go from 10,000 mechanical engineers to 1,000 mechanical engineers and and 10 xing the number of double E's and software engineers they need to develop next versions of cars. And if, you know, I think my wife or one of my kids is on their third generation of Prius. Our first Prius that we had in 2002, it's better gas mileage, if you will, quote unquote, range than the, the newer ones. And I, I kept thinking, you know, in the world of potential energy and kinetic energy and management of those things, we need to figure out between the cloud and route mapping, uh, between the ability to take vertical ups and downs of the car through shocks and vibration, the ability to recover fully the, the complete brake energy, uh, the ability to manage thermoelectric energy in a better way, that the battery pack, the BMS, and an integration with the automotive controller at the master level need to actually have uh, resolutions around solving for the first law of thermodynamics so that we actually get an objective of sort of two to three X the range at about half the cost where we are today. And not that EVs aren't gonna dominate anyways, I'm just thinking the roadmap is still very robust ahead for price performance. That was my point. Totally. I think, uh, yeah, an interesting future of uh, almost how do we make the EVs more economically accessible, right, by continuing to optimize the whole system. Um, definitely enticing. I think, Danya, maybe you can give us some clarity on the answer you provided as well. Um, yes. So I, I'm building on what I said earlier about safety. So this is about taking the fear out of the battery. And if we just look at the next 10 years, where are we going to go in the next 10 years? So the next 10 years really is about scaling. You know, where we are today, I think Tesla has already proven that EVs are real and you can manufacture at scale. Actually, people want to buy an EV. But how do we get from where we are today to having tens of millions of EVs out there for people uh, for people to, to buy it and be comfortable buying it? 
So that means tens of millions of EVs. Now, you know, you have to look at the entire ecosystem from all the way from mining materials all the way to recycling. And you have to have incremental improvements along the entire way. And it's going to take that, that whole ecosystem to work together. But at the center of it all is a battery, which is, you know, something we keep talking about. And, and it's taking that battery and now scaling it to hundreds of millions of batteries that need to be produced globally. So you're going to have factories that are going to be opening up across the world. Um, we look at where we are today, where the, you know, the legacy battery manufacturers that have been supplying to the consumer industry for 20, 30 years, they're struggling to make good batteries. They're struggling to scale. Um, and you're going to have different, um, different form factors, different materials. Well, the materials won't change that much, but you're going to have different form factors, different um, designs based on what each uh, company is doing. So now you have to scale it. You scale it across building new factories, uh, bringing up uh, qualifying equipment, validating it, and then hiring a workforce to run and, and produce these batteries. And, you know, frankly, if you haven't built a battery before, it's very hard to appreciate the nuances that are involved in battery manufacturing, because what something that could seem so benign ends up having catastrophic effects. Mm. So it becomes really important that as that battery is used and as we scale, and believe me, there will be a lot of problems over the next 10 years as we scale this effort. But that's why it becomes really crucial that when the battery is used, it's constantly managed. We're constantly probing and measuring the battery in real time to find out exactly what it's doing and then being able to act on it and predict where it's going to go. You know, um, and, and that way you can not only just manage its performance during its first life, but actually keep it healthy to, so it can go into its second life. Super fair. And kind of the, the initial kind of battery data infrastructure layer that we talked about almost enabling, it sounds like a, a future generation of battery manufacturing and enabling all the other use cases towards the end of life, I think will be really fascinating. And uh, Venkat, you're, you're up next. I'm curious to hear kind of where your answer landed. Any guesses? I'll let you go. <laughs> OK, all right. Uh, Tal knows what I'm going to say, right? Uh, it's robots, robots, robots. Um, and so uh, I'll just talk about a journey which actually got me to where I am. And, and I think it actually will resonate with the comment that Mark uh, made. Um, you know, if you sort of look at, uh, if you track the reference class of innovation in this space, right? You, you look at lab innovation to market, right? It's it's off order, you know, 18 years or so, right? So uh, it, it's a really long time. And, and, and as Mark said, right, you have to, uh, you have to drop 100 million, wait seven years to see if something's real or not, right? And uh, you know, you look at um, you know, Sila, right? 55,000 iterations before they got to their first first product. Um, QuantumScape has done two million experiments. I'm sure Chicha will have a similar large number. So you know, that this is this is a this is not a, a viable strategy uh, with the climate change race that we have to run. Um, and so. Uh, actually, the, the the journey that I took, it's about a four-year journey. Um, summer of 2017, um, uh, I, I spent that at a, at a lithium metal startup, and I actually shadowed an, uh, an electrolyte scientist. And I actually just watched what he did, uh, every single step that he did. And then I came back uh, after that summer, and I said, OK, I'm going to automate every single experiment that he did. And four years later, we've now built two robots, Otto and Clio, that basically can do every single task that that scientist had done. And what we can do now is within seven minutes, right? We can now evaluate an electrolyte for its utility in a particular application completely autonomously. Right? And and in, and in fact, what we showed in in 2020 when uh, COVID hit was actually something that uh, was opposite to everything uh, that people would have normally felt, which is drop in productivity. Our productivity went 3x because we suddenly could operate at 24 hours uh, because there was no one. Otherwise, we were uh, you know regulated to not run when someone was not there. So we would run for eight hours, but now nobody was there on campus. So we actually could run 24 hours. And in fact, for three and a half months, we ran it completely without, and you know, obviously one, once a week, someone went in to restock the solution, but that was the only human step in that. And I think the power of robotic experimentation is going to be unimaginable in terms of what it's going to do. And that, if you pair with all of the innovations that we said we are going to get in the next five years, right, which is data, machine learning, you know, watching all of these things, you know, we're going to innovate at a rate that is uh, is going to be astronomical, and and you can take that uh, uh, that progress in one of two axes. You know, like what Mark 
pointed out, right? Either you can take it on the time axis or you can take it on the dollar axis, right? So it's probably going to be somewhere between five to 10 X acceleration in terms of the number of experiments that you can avoid. So which means that you can either, you know, put the same hundred million dollars and then get the answer in three years as opposed to 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, uh, you know, maybe you wait the same 10 years and then and then probably do it um, with 5X uh, capital reduction, right? I think I think that is going to be the, the fundamental thing. Uh, and, and here what we need is more people uh, that think about robotic experimentation in battery space. In fact, the biggest challenge has been for me to hire someone that has a robotics interest uh, and, and at Carnegie Mellon, right, which is the sort of home of field robotics, right? Uh, so it's even more competitive, right? Uh, because, you know, obviously, you know, the robotics is another sort of exciting area where there's massive amount of innovation going on. So being able to pull some of that talent to our domain uh, and, and being, you know, being able to show that, listen, this is, this is something that will make a real impact. Uh, I think training the workforce to be able to look at these things. I think we've done a tremendous job with data and machine learning so far. I think we have now a, a pretty strong talent pool in that space. I think we, I think the talent pool around robotic roboticization and automation on the, uh, on the early stage R and D is almost non-existent. So I think this is the space that I think uh, would be most interesting to focus on. And if successful, 10 years out, we're going to innovate at a rate that is un unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great, an amazing vision, truly. I think it also, it dovetails well with uh, Mark Vandenberg and, and kind of the vision of the GMs of the world, not necessarily becoming all mechanical engineers, but shifting more towards uh, battery science, battery data. So uh, AK, do you want to lead us down the path of your vision for the future? Yeah, absolutely. I want to thank Venkat for his vision. I, I, I can't agree more. It's how do we take traditional wet chemistry and electrochemistry into something more uh, automated to accelerate the innovation rate. I think this is what we all need. How do we innovate faster within the realm of battery? Uh, when it comes to, to my answer, I actually kept it along the lines of the BMS and data, and I chose to describe it as conscious and integrated cloud-based controls. What do I mean by that? And I think, I think Mark Vandenberg hinted towards that as well with, with his optim ideas of optimization. So what I meant by conscious and integrated cloud-based controls, um, I admit I'm a little bit more biased because of our focus on commercial vehicles, where um, the owner of the fleet has more control instead of, um, you know, your neighbor telling you what to do with your consumer vehicle, right? Uh, but in the long term, when, when, when batteries on vehicles and trucks uh, are controlled uh, or, or the vehicle is more autonomous. Um, there's and, uh, the added connectivity between the batteries and the grid. There's no reason for every battery to be a, st a standalone battery or, or, or thought of as a standalone battery. There's an energy problem, an energy crisis, demand, uh, supply of energy, and that connectivity and that infrastructure that is enabling this data to be harvested can now make decisions that uh, support the whole population instead of the decision being made for every unique battery independent of its neighbors mm -hmm. to say. So as a result, we can continuously uh, 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 optimize further and further. So you could, uh, uh, have a, a tool, uh, uh, the mother of all AIs controlling all those energy systems or battery systems, really deciding which uh, vehicle to deploy based on uh, a certain optimization for the life of the assets mm -hmm. collectively. And, and I think, you know, maybe this is a bit more than 10 years, but there are micro grids or micro models where uh, this can already be applied. Now, specifically for us, uh, since we deal with commercial vehicles, um, where total cost of ownership is, is critical uh, and vehicles are, you know, as you're driving it, then you're, you're making the economics of your fleet. Um, there's room to couple uh, this uh, with such an application. So I, I think this this also ties into you know first and second law of thermodynamics. Uh, how do you uh, take into account the roads that are going to be traveled, the incidents towards the road, 
and other more complex uh, situations. Uh, and that's why I was referring it as a more conscious um, optimization instead of every battery optimizing independently uh, for its own health, to say. Another grand vision, I think networking the batteries and having a grand layer of battery intelligence is would be an amazing future. And uh, um, I think we'll we'll get a few more answers from Chi Chao and then Tal, and hopefully we'll have a, a little bit of time for a broader discussion about all these different aspects of the future. Yeah, uh, so I picked a safe battery without compromise on uh, performance and uh, range. So I think in the near term, maybe three to five years, well, uh, as you increase the energy density of these batteries, actually the safety actually gets worse. Um, it, it's actually harder to make a high energy density battery safe. Um, and then in the near term, you, you can probably mitigate the safety risk at the vehicle level, at the pack level by using some type of software. But I think in the long term, maybe eight years to 10 years, really we should develop a new material, a new electrolyte or a new cathode that can still deliver the high energy density, but then it's much safer. Because today, a lot of the new materials that people are working on, uh, if it's safer, but then either the energy density is lower or the, the room temperature performance is poor. So I think um, in uh, eight to 10 years, hopefully we can actually develop a new material, um, um, electrolyte, cathode, that, that can really hit the high energy density, but then still maintain the safety. Sounds like some of that resonated with you too, Tal. Um, I'd love to hear your perspective on where the future is going. Yeah, so I think uh, echoing the earlier uh, panelists, you know, we're in the scalability phase of this industry. There's going to be continuous and constant improvement. Hopefully we could accelerate that with robots and ML uh, for next generation materials. But fundamentally for this industry to really take off, you know, uh, our organizations are going to need to learn to understand their battery systems uh, to a much, much greater degree, both from a safety perspective and predictability <laughs> of performance. Um, otherwise, we're going to see, you know, tremendous amount of you know winners or losers or you know I hate to say this but like a bloodbath in the industry um there's only so many of these large recalls that the industry could sustain and many organizations can uh delays in program launches the you know you know we look at these factories that are all being spun up you know if you don't get that factory up and running within a short period of time those companies are going to go out of business as well and so really the key here is speed and speed to being able to like understand these systems, identify problems and very quickly iterate and address these issues before they come, you know, systemic and much larger issues uh, that we're seeing now with the recalls in the field. Um, on the other side, you know, we are seeing organizations, you know, namely, you know, Tesla and Apple are great examples where they have very large battery organizations that trust data and have data at its core. And they're able to, you know, address these quick, issues they're able to quickly in, in an agile fashion you know remediate issues whether it's with partial recalls on specific devices versus these total recalls uh, or you know over the air updates uh, to enhance things like range and enhance the customer experience supporting you know high residual values and resale of these systems um, it really comes down to fundamentally understanding these battery systems so that you know, you literally, you know, your organization will survive moving forward, whether you're a startup or a traditional OEM or, you know, a fleet operator, uh, it really comes down to understanding your battery systems and scale. Awesome. I think uh, bloodbath notwithstanding, the future definitely sounds bright on, on all these topics. I'd be really interested to loop back um, and maybe get Sue's perspective on, yeah, I think you led some of the charge on the, the, the need for a data kind of, um, data kind of foundational layer in our earlier discussion. How do you see that playing into the way batteries interact with the grid and maybe enabling some of those kind of additional value opportunities for a battery once it's, you know, out of a car, out of a fleet? Okay, so this let your the question is about stationary, but be, before I answer that, let me just give a thumbs up to Tal because I want to echo what he said, which is all of our expectations about what the future is going to look like are based on the fact that there is not some massive setback due to manufacturing defects that are occurring. And and certainly I would say Tal and, and Che Chow um, are in the throes of that and I have tremendous respect for that. So thank you because all of our futures <laughs> depend on that. 
So um, I very, I think that needs that really needs to be said how critical that is. But when it when it comes to stationary storage and Second Life batteries, um, that's pretty complicated. Mobility is a very complicated thing. And but the thing about mobility is that you design a car for 300 miles, and on the average you use it 50 or 60 miles a day. So there's this kind of squishy room. On like if you overshoot or you know if you are like too aggressive and your batteries is decaying too quickly, you know you still got a daily a very positive experience. When you go to stationary, it's not done. It's not done that way. Those cells are and those those systems are designed and the cells are utilized almost a hundred percent, maybe eighty percent. So there's less room for error. It is a much more. It's a pure economic situation you aren't attaching like a box of batteries to shift solar energy i mean if you put it in a fancy box like you put a car you know a battery in a fancy car you're not going to get to charge more so the grid is pure economics it's a more demanding situation because you have to use the battery the entire time the expectation is that asset is going to last 20 years certainly i know mpv want to get as much money as they can in the first four to five years but the fact of the matter is these things are scaled to be 20 years and there's all this tremendous complexity on how, not only what are all these various uses but then as the grid integrates and becomes smart and then you add to it climate change and the need for flexibility i think stationary storage is going to blow the doors <laughs> off of the need to have ai and machine learning and this really is going to take again um, a good measure of open source data or data that can be handled in a way which is confidential because there's certainly, we can't solve the grid problem with a single source of data. Okay, so stationary is more complex. The need for open data or some form of data sharing is even more critical. And so that's the next wave that's gonna be another wild west. I don't know if I answered your question, but no. that's what I have to say about stationary. <laughs> no, that, it's was, hard. that was definitely an answer to the question, and I think really helpful to kind of lay out all the the different needs. Um, I, I guess, Mark, um, I know you have some thoughts on the kind of techno economics of energy storage. I don't know if that resonated with you on the the second life uses being really pointed on on the economics more so than how the battery is packaged and kind of how fancy it is. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, um, Second Life Use, I, I have the um, perhaps unfortunate financial um, experience of investing in Project Better Place many years ago, <laughs> considering battery swap out. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges there is, you know, what are the economic models for Second Life Use? And how does some, someone use their primary battery set of conditions um, in an effective way that optimizes the depreciation, right? So if you think about second life battery, you just think about it as like a car lease, right? Maybe some element of your car is going to be depreciated at one rate versus another. Um, I'm, I've got some investments in, in, in the stationary storage market for both, you know, both power grid and data centers and, and UPS and defense. I was going to highlight to folks, this is one of my remaining asset values from a vanadium flow battery investment I made, which is a vanadium cufflink that the CEO made for me. So my return on invested capital is something to do with fashion. Um, but I, I'm a big fan. I, I think the secondary use, I think one of the trade-offs that I've been thinking about in an area which is gaining some momentum but still needs a lot of investment is, is how we handle the total life cycle of the raw materials that go into batteries. And so at some point, a secondary use case for an automotive EV battery versus the time it gets used, the cost to re-implement it in a secondary use case versus it going back into the supply chain through a recycling operation. Uh, those are things that I don't think I have a very good um, opinion on. And I think the economics will be the driver for that. So anyway. Yeah, I think that might Just, be an interesting one for, for Tal as far as the end-to-end the -end life cycle. I think your platform, you know, you deal with looking at the battery and the data of the battery from end to end do you have any thoughts on what mark just mentioned no and i think what mark just brought up on you know recycling here uh that's really you know near term we've seen the economics around electric vehicles work out now over the lifetime costs you know so 
it's going to be great if we could potentially put these batteries into second life applications. I think the reality is, you know, the reliability needs for the grid, the continuous decreasing costs for new batteries and the warranties you're going to get from those are really going to stimmy that, you know, at least in the midterm until we have a really good understanding of these systems. As soon as you have to do multiple truck rolls each time to replace and manage these batteries, those economics don't work out. And so really more important is, you know, getting as much life out of those vehicles in early life. We're seeing, you know, more fleet applications. We're seeing, you know, business models change with, you know, vehicle sharing. And, you know, if you could just route that vehicle who's lower in life into alternative uh, routes, you know, getting more life out of it is going to be really important. And ultimately, you know, that residual value, getting it out of the recycling chain uh, is seems to me as a more realistic pathway to large scale you know, value capture along the entire you know, supply chain here. Mm. And I think uh, I saw Venkat nodding, but I, I also remember, AK, you mentioned, you know, working with fleets and supplying the, your battery systems to fleets. Obviously, the more flexible use and potentially even second life of those batteries is an attractive value proposition. I'm not sure if you, if this kind of sparked any thoughts, if you can share maybe some insights that you have. Yeah, definitely. No, I mean, uh, there's uh, many ways of looking at this. First and foremost, we do, I can tell you that uh, we do, um, one of our, uh, let's say, design approaches and discipline focuses on uh, design for second life and design for end of life, right? So what does that mean? Because end of life and second life, you have to start from the beginning to avoid an ambiguity at the end. So um, on the second life point of view, that is uh, um, achieved through, um, you know, the design for serviceability and <clears throat> ease of disassembly uh, and reconfiguration or reconfigurability. Um, and design for recyclability means, uh, uh, you know, avoiding use of uh, certain material and component classes that um, the current uh, direction of uh, chemical thermal um, processes in recycling um, cannot work with. So, um, you know, you, you have to, from the beginning, decide what you're putting in your battery to make it easier from the day of recycling to recover uh, as high of a rate of the materials as possibly can. So this is how I would uh, look at this. Now, on the fleet side, yeah, so one of the items we, we, we see a lot of interest on is um, opportunities for fleet owners to take um, the batteries that they own at the end of the first life and be able to deploy these for their own um, electrical infrastructure. So after, um, you know, trucks, trucks or batteries, um, you know, finish their first life, how do we take these batteries and uh, use them to do, let's say, peak shaving um, or other uh, energy flow management at the facilities and the localities of um, uh, those fleet managers and their hubs, right? And usually those hubs are in highly industrial and commercial uh, areas. So how could uh, these batteries serve uh, through Second Life um, that region or locality? Uh, there's a lot of other interesting uh, areas that are more niche and specific, but I, I, will, I will specify one anecdotally. Um, so in the world of uh, refuse trucks, um, that's an area that's going through a lot of electrification right now, garbage trucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in a lot of uh, uh, lands uh, and, 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 and fill, fill lands, um, there's a lot of methane that is being generated. And... Um, some of those uh, uh, land managers, what they do is uh, they use uh, turbines uh, to uh, burn that methane and generate electricity. And oftentimes, um, that, that, that generation is not uh, uh, meeting the demand timeline. So batteries for Second Life um, can be utilized to store that uh, uh, methane being converted to electricity for future use. Uh, that can then gets feedback into the charging infrastructure perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, of the vehicle so that way you like know, a, close the cycle and like the infrastructure. yeah like a combined closed cycle almost across batteries and the refuse and the yeah the whole system 
Um, I, we have some great questions going off uh, in our chat right now. We are unfortunately a little bit over time. I'm, I'd love to open this up to getting some audience feedback on, on all of these answers. I think uh, that won't kind of preclude us from, from discussing some of these topics in the chat box as well. But if we can go on and uh, just for a quick minute, move to the audience polling section. So if you're joining us uh, as, as an audience member, now is your time. Hopefully you had your cell phone at the ready. Uh, or if not, you can look in the comment section and copy and paste the link into your web browser. This will allow you to see a poll where first we'll ask you what part of uh, you know the, the industry you're coming from. Are you an investor? Are you a startup founder? There we go. Okay, we're starting to get some engagement. Again, you should be able to see the link in the comment box. Um, please do answer this first question or use the QR code and it'll help us get a sense of where everyone's coming from. Um, and we'll have about a little under a minute right now. Okay, we're getting some answers coming in. Amazing. Uh, looks like we got a pretty big split between startup founders and investors, uh, some academia, some industry. It's interesting because yesterday we were evenly split between every single group. So um, everybody, we got a little over 30 seconds left. Okay, some more academia representation. Um, perfect. This will, yeah, this will really help us get uh, a better understanding of where feedback on all these different answers to what the future looks like is coming from. Um, Perfect. 20 seconds or so. Got some more industry representation now as well. Excellent. Let's keep on voting under 15 seconds right now. Uh, hopefully nobody's having too much trouble with our with our Mentimeter system. And we will move on soon uh, to if you stay in the same page, if you're if you're on this poll as an audience member and you don't click out or you don't leave right now, we will move on to our first question that we asked our panelists and we'll see all of their answers uh, that you'll be able to choose from as what you think is the most exciting uh, portion of, of kind of what the most impactful innovation in the next five years will be. So. Go ahead and uh, take a look if you're in the polling platform. If we're able to zoom in here so that uh, on the panel side of things, we're able to see where people are responding. We've got about a minute. So there you go. If you're in the audience, you're voting on the answers that are uh, that our panelists provided to this first question about what the most impactful innovation to be realized in the next five years will be. Super neat. Okay, I can see that uh, lots of folks excited in intelligent, reliable, and scalable software. Uh, some AI guided new battery chemistry optimization. Interesting. I think Venkat will be excited to see that one. Uh, unfunded innovation is also getting some love. Okay, more interest uh, from the startup side and, and startup uh, audience members on the scalable software. Okay, pretty even across the board. We're under 30 seconds here. Some more excitement around uh, chemistry optimization. Um, perfect. A lot of startup founders chiming in there. Some industry members as well. So maybe that'll get us towards, uh, you know, the, the vision that Mark mentioned of a lot of our, our traditional companies in the automotive space moving towards becoming battery savvy, battery science savvy. Um, neat. We got about three seconds left here. So we will then, okay. Voting is closed on this first section. If you're, uh, on our panel, this will give us some fodder for discussion. It's exciting, exciting to see where people answer. And now we'll move on to getting answers to the second question. We're doing this in rapid succession. So again, if you're in the audience, do stay online, uh, mm -hmm. stay with us and now go ahead and, uh, vote for what answers to the second question that we posed our panel um, about the most challenging and disruptive innovation in the next 10 years uh, will be. So now is your chance. Opening up the polling here in just a second. There we go. And we'll get a timer here in a minute as well. But early excitement from, uh, from audience members around the end-to-end -end, uh, robotic experimentation. I know the text is quite small uh, for us here in the in the panel. I think we'll be able to fix that in just a minute. Yeah, yeah. We'll get we'll get the font sorted in just a minute. Okay, and uh, getting up on 40 seconds here. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I gotta put my glasses on here. Lots of excitement on planned second life batteries. Exciting. <laughs> um, we're having a little back and forth with the panel here. We had such an in-depth discussion. We're wondering whose answers were whose, but uh, regardless, these are all really interesting things to see uh, where where our audience is, is voting on. So startup founders and startup members interested in that planned second life. Uh, we got some uh, interest from academia also in Second Life. Not a lot of uh, excitement around the optimizing mobility around the second law of thermodynamics. Mark, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. um, excellent. And voting is closed. Okay, so if we could bring up the answers to that first uh, to the first poll from our audience, it would be cool to dive in. Okay, we're getting getting one second to get the QR code off screen. Um, from uh, from our panel, is there anything initially exciting before we get that up there? Anything that surprised you all? I, I actually thought I would win the second round and lose the first round. Uh, <laughs> it's it's shocking how much interest there is in AI guided mature design. Yeah, I uh, I think hopefully we can get that back up on screen, but. Um, can you make it even larger? <laughs> Let's get our magnifying we don't want to Why is it so small? OK. Yeah, yeah I think now it's better. It, I yeah, think yeah, yeah. I, I can, yeah, I can see it now. Yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, so intelligent, reliable, and scalable software had a lot of hits from uh, the startup space. Uh, unknown is, and other are typically people who joined midway through. Um, but any anything that jumps out at, at the panel, Venkat, anything that, that you thought was exciting from this? Yeah, I, I think it was surprising that uh, there was so much excitement now, intelligent, reliable, and scalable software. Uh, congrats to Danya for picking that. I think that's, yes. that's an yeah. underappreciated aspect in batteries, right? I think we don't have as much uh, folks thinking about the sort of scalable software, uh, which is, I think, obviously, especially around security and, and other aspects uh, beyond all the exciting stuff we have talked about on like being able to, you know, do materials innovation or, or detecting or, or managing them safely. Uh, I think all of the sort of back end on, you know, scalable and uh, info security and so on. So I'm sure Tal and Danya might have lots of insights there. Yeah, Danya um, and Tal, yeah. go for it. I feel. <laughs> It seems like there's there's sort of two there's two realms though there's like what's the impact in the early stage of mm -hmm. development which is like machine learning for like discovery but then there's this other part which are is a completely different world which is what is it when you get towards maturity right now and I think that there's you know those are two different questions and I think the distribution reflects the fact that those are two different parts of the TRL line, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, and doing doing this at scale uh, on the software side in the battery space is still relatively immature. There's a lot of early siloed efforts, but really building it out and understanding BMSs to a better degree, catching safety issues. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it all uh, evolves here. Yeah, and and I'd like to also add that. Um, you know, when you when we look at, at batteries today, uh, the batteries today that we're using, we're not using them to their full potential. So it's how do you ex expand that performance envelope while keeping the battery safe at all times? So it has to come back to um, as you use the battery, you constantly have to have to um, measure what it's doing and close the loop and manage it and mitigate the aging that's taking place um, as the battery is going. You know, lithium ion is here to stay. It's not going to go away. Um, yes, there's a lot of improvements on new materials, but it's going to take time. And those new materials by themselves are not going to just come, come in and save the world. So you still need to rely on software. You still need to be able to um, uh, measure, use the data. Data is critical. The data helps you because manufacturing, battery manufacturing is not, you know, it's not easy. So there's always going to be uh, cell to cell variations or there will be defects, even with new materials, even with new manufacturing processes. 
you still can't get away from that problem. So it becomes very important that you get to manage it with software. And the, the best thing about software is you don't need any additional hardware. You can just sit on the BMS that's right next to the battery, constantly talking to the BMS. So it can make these decisions in real time to mitigate and manage the battery uh, you know, throughout its use. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think uh, if there, there are any other closing thoughts on, on where the audience thought the next five years were going, we can hear them. If not, we'll move on to, to the, the further afield question. And I think uh, Sue, Sue's answer got, uh, got some great traction here. Okay, we'll pull this one up. Um, Get larger, so, please. <laughs> can, we, can we do a little zoom from the back end, potentially? No, this might be what we got. Um, so, yeah, we'll work on that for the next session. But uh, plan second life batteries and then close second safe batteries that uh, don't compromise on performance. So, uh, Sue and Chi Chao, yeah, I, I'd love to maybe hear where, and, and it looks like on, on the safe batteries that don't compromise on performance is maybe, um, oh, it's tough that there's some, some votes from other, but um, it looks like excitement from the startup space. And then uh, same actually on the plant second life batteries. Yeah, I think uh, um, in, in terms of the safe batteries, um, definitely software, um, we're going to need to do a lot of that. And then uh, both from manufacturing to, to actual usage, um, um, just more frequent 24-7 uh, monitoring of the the key parameters. But also all the software is is, is, is wonderful, but still um, it's more like a band-aid because the battery itself is not safe, right? If the battery itself is safe, then you probably wouldn't need all the, the, the software. So I think mm -hmm. um, still there are a lot of really good work um, that um, companies are doing, basically trying to make the battery safe and then if you can make the battery uh have higher energy density than today's lithium-ion but just as safe as lithium-ion then effectively that's actually safer than lithium-ion um, because of that the uh, um, trade-off between energy density and uh, uh, safety and now there are companies that work on for example uh, electrical materials coatings on the separators coatings on the cathode uh, um, particles that enable even higher energy density uh, higher voltage higher capacity uh, cathode but then still quite stable and um, i mean if we can make the so if we can make the cell safer and then you can save a lot of the software, the packaging, um, and then all the overhead to make the the car safer because it, because then it's just easier to make a safer. Uh, it's easier to make a car with a safer battery safe than to make a car with a less safe battery safe. <laughs> I think uh, that's some logic that we can all agree with. Uh, and it, does anyone have any other takeaways they'd like to point out from this graph? I, again, I know the text is super small. I think safety is also kind of coming in third here and a lot like broad interest in safety, I suppose. So um, any any thoughts on that? I, I'm going to make a make a make a joke here, but I think that's uh, probably there's a lot of reality to it is that uh, Mark's 0% uh, vote on Mark's is actually a signal of the challenge in the battery industry around a lack of understanding of second law of thermodynamics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is the one law that you have to never violate. Uh, everything else, uh, you know, maybe maybe there is unknown physics around. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, the challenge uh, really, uh, I think, for uh, uh, for uh, battery innovation is to uh, pay attention to Mark's point uh, and, uh, and think about second law as you are doing things. So I think that's a, it, it's a, I think it is a, it is uh, an expected uh, uh, outcome in that if I, you know, if I ask my students, what's the one law that scares you, would, they would think definitely 100% of them will agree that it's second law. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, you know, so so is the audience, right? But I think it is the one law that we have to somehow uh, try and force ourselves to to follow as much as possible. 
Th thanks for the shout out, Ben Cat. I, 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 I only put that there because the, the rest of you all are going to have much more sort of informed opinions about specific innovations. But I actually think an electrification of mobility changes so many things beyond what normal people, even in the auto industry, think about, right? It changes the business model, it changes the design, it changes uh, a consumer's intimacy with the energy platform itself. Our ability to use electricity, electrons, as opposed to hydrocarbons, it's, it's, a whole, it's a whole new world. And I think it's fantastic if you're a young person entering the mobility space for a career to think about all the different options that are gonna be there for you as a designer, for business models, for executives. I, I think I told uh, Mark B that, uh, the first and second laws ought to be required coursework for all C-suite executives in the Fortune 5000 companies. So. There's a there's a Coursera class that's freely available that I've taught uh, that I've taught. Yeah. So, okay. as well. <laughs> and I also now put my energy storage class also now up on YouTube. So lots of required reading material for your. Okay, students. I'm making a note. Follow-up email to this session will include a curriculum, so uh, <laughs> everyone who's joining, <laughs> you'll be able to follow along. Um, perfect. I, I think it's always fun to see what the audience has to say. And I think we touch on something important, which is that socializing these innovations and, and having you know everybody understand what electrification means is is also part of, of this battle. And, and I think it's interesting to think how how BMS and and contextualizing the health of the battery or the state of the battery is a big part of of you know having car owners understand what their car is doing, having cell phone owners understand how their battery health is doing. Um, I think that's that's certainly a big part of it. Um, I think next is, you know, the last 30 minutes or so for us to open up the floor to uh, comments and questions from the audience. Um, for us on the panel, I believe they'll be fed in to through our chat. But if you are in the audience, now is your time to go ahead and use the comment section, post any questions that you might want to ask of our panel, and, uh, and we'll just get straight to them. It might just take a second for us here to, to collect some questions. I think earlier on internally, um, there was some interest uh, from Chi Chao, even if you can just give us the high level of your battery data day for, for SES, people were curious to learn more. Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. So we did that um, um, because one, um, we felt that a lot of companies, especially the, the new emerging companies um, tend to uh, make claims, um, but then all the claims sound similar. Um, you know, it's, it's, people say it's like you can charge a car in five minutes and then go 500 miles, right? <laughs> but, but how? <laughs> and and uh, um, so, and I think well, one, it's really exciting that the lots of companies and research labs are working on new stuff, but we need to to really implement some type of rigorous um, standards. And we still have a lot of work to do. For example, this needs to be tested at a, 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 a reputable third party, and then you have to use the same cell. You can't change it. You can't have like cell optimized for energy density and then test that for energy density, and a different cell optimized for cycle life, test that for cycle life, and then different one optimized for safety. So it has to be the same cell, and then just, just from the basic stuff. Um, we all know it's a new technology, so it's, it's not gonna be like the LG Panasonic, very mature, well characterized, but just the basic stuff. Measure the energy density, the, the mass, the volume, the capacity, some basic cycle life, room temperature, high temperature, low temperature, and then just basic safety, like some standards to, to help the community to really see what is real and what is uh, just hype. Totally fair, totally fair. And uh, thanks for, for leading the charge with SES. I think that's a, a needed kind of movement. So the first question here from, from our audience revolves around how good a BMS needs to be on false negatives to make them robust uh, or you know to make them kind of valuable, I suppose. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe Danya, if you have a thought on this, uh, you know, given the experience with Pinobo. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Again? Yeah, yeah. the question, uh, it should also be in our private chat. It's the first one at the top. How good does a BMS need to be or how good should it be on false negatives uh, to, for it to be robust? Is there a certain threshold of, of you know, false negatives? I guess also what we would probably, yeah, yeah. False negatives is what we would care about in this case. 
Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you have to you have to be as best as best as you can be um, in terms of false negatives. Um, so a lot of this comes down to to the to your models and to the data that you're measuring and how you um, how how you 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 basically are training your models to be able to determine if you have a false negative or or, or a false positive. So, um, you know, in, the, in our experience, we have not, um, you know, we have not seen too much of that. Yeah, I think also something that I've heard a few times in the discussion is, you know, it's not, it, it's more so about the, the interval that you get to before knowing that something is going to go wrong or before something is trending negatively. Not so much saying that exactly something is going to happen now, but that the, the trend is going in the wrong direction, right? Exactly. And this is why when you're constantly measuring and you're in, and you're comparing that data, you can see how it's changing from cycle to cycle within a cycle and from cycle to cycle, you're collecting thousands of data points. So you can tell where things are changing and how they're changing. Mm -mm. Yeah, Perfect. Mark, I think there's some insight in that. Um, so actually, the, the way we look at this is uh, aside just the state estimators um, in a BMS, the state estimators are maybe, even though important, sometimes they can be only 1% of all the software code. So the way we would look at that is uh, look at the functions list, right? So the items that are function critical, such that the action of opening a contact, for example, which would break down the, the circuit. Uh, that is not uh, tolerant of false negatives, for example. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are other areas where, uh, you know, false negative can be tolerated uh, and you protect against that with redundancies. So that's why there's always more than one method or computational method um, capturing a state or capturing an estimation because of the need for redundancy, similar on the sensor side. Now, if that... Uh, uh, negative flag is sustained, uh, we can send a warning signal uh, to the user and request for servicing or further diagnostics. Uh, but I would say it, it truly depends on the hierarchy of how critical to safety and function uh, the yeah. items are. Excellent. I think that's super helpful to understand the, the level of criticality and redundancy. Um, maybe we'll move on to the next question here. This is an interesting one. Uh, a lot of BMS startup companies seem to create a lot of value but don't seem to capture that value. What business models should startups use to capture the great value they create? Um, anyone want to take the lead on this one? Maybe. Yeah, uh, since, uh, I think, yeah I, I think it's a question fundamentally. Like, is that value differentiable, and can these companies achieve it in other ways? I think right now a lot of these organizations, you know, that are supposed to adopt BMSs are not. Uh, seeing that value is differentiable or, or larger. Uh, and so it makes them, you know, not really uh, open up those secondary business models, uh, you know, to these startups developing BMSs. Um, and so it's really about, you know, taking it end to end, you know, proving out your BMS algorithms. Uh, a lot of BMS algorithms are black box and can't really be proven. You put out claims like, oh, we have a 300% improvement. Uh, and your battery system, uh, and no one could really, you know, tell the difference. Really, tell you if that's true or not at a large scale, mm -hmm. um, and then you know, connecting the dots to the larger value that you can create uh, in new business models. It does open up. And there's lots of those, whether it's vehicle to grid and otherwise uh, multi modes of mobility and, and whatnot. But uh, fundamentally, uh, there's a dis disconnect and in trust into the efficacy of a lot of these BMS uh, models that are out there. Totally fair. I, I think that insight's super helpful. And we'll move on to another question for Chicha and Sue. Uh, someone is asking if it's possible to speak more on how to create representative models that address mechanical variation and the standards around electrical chemical variation. Maybe uh, Sue can talk about electrochemical chemical variation and then I'll talk about mechanical. Okay. Um, but from our um, um, experience actually mechanical is uh, quite challenging um, because in the manufacturing process you really have to put a lot of sensors um, welding stacking um, the thickness variation um, even just like transporting from one equipment to the next equipment the jelly roll may move 
um, and then and then really, uh, um, um, I think Tom mentioned this: having this infrastructure of sensors on the manufacturing equipment, like a lot of sensors, um, X-rays, CT, and then you also have to do this in a high speed because you're making like five cells, eight cells per minute. Um, so all these um, all these detections have to happen uh, uh, live, but then then you can actually build a, a model. For example, um, if, the, if the thickness variation, uh, variation is, uh, is is within say say two microns, then okay, um, you are 700 plus cycles. If it's within five microns, uh, then you are um, uh, just uh, less than that. So so a lot of uh, data. Uh, just a massive amount of sensors and uh, infrastructure on the manufacturing equipment. So sensors to then create bounds that give you confidence about the future performance of the batteries is kind of the approach that it sounds like. Right. So you use the sensors to to collect the data, and then you uh, basically build these cells, and then these cells you intentionally have all these these variations, and then test the cells, and then you uh, collect the results, the the data of those cells, and then you match. The results, the data of the cells, with the the uh, data from the sensors. Totally. Yeah, and yeah, just to feed off of that, uh, yeah. it was also another question that popped here on like what data do we connect from BMSs and systems in the field? Uh, we're sort of in this early stage now where there's many unknown unknowns, and we need to go in and actually track uh, more data than we think we need right now, uh, just to be able to catch all these modalities and things that will ultimately lead to whether it's life extension or maximizing the value of these systems or pre predicting and preventing issues. Uh, mm -hmm. So the more data, the better at this stage of the industry. And Sue, maybe on the, the representative models for the electrochemistry of these cells, is that something mm -hmm. that you have a few takes on? Uh, yes, thanks for allowing me to uh, comment here. And, and then before I give my answer, let's, let me just again sort of present uh, the context of this. There's two different sorts of uh, intentions here, as we've got with uh, Che Chao and Tal. That is about looking for extreme outliers, mm. which are going to affect uh, safety or some <clears throat> other catastrophic event that we don't want to happen. And that is that tracks back to mechanics in the manufacturing process, which is like, as we all know, that's like super important that we can have these these uh, recall events continuing. The comments that I was making relate more to early TRL, not to manufacturing, but to the design, uh, the discovery of new materials and the design of cells and trying to understand how something works. In that framework, what we're looking for there is not outliers, but what we're looking for is on the average, how does this system behave? And then what we need to have is we need we need to have an accuracy within plus or minus anywhere from 50 to 60 cycles of their life when you project out to 2,500 cycles. Okay, so that is a different objective than those other have others have. Now, in that framework, there is a very well established electrochemical discipline which says when these things fail, there's like six or seven distinct modes of failure. Some of those are related to the mechanics of the actual particles themselves, and some of those are related to the details of the design. And so the path degradation depends, the, the, the details of the degradation and the life depend on what is the chemistry of the cell, what is the cell design, and how do you use it? And in that, there is a framework for how to predict a good average value, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's, let's say today, it's 70 cycles to go out to 2,500 cycles. That in the future can get better and the accuracy can improve if we have more data. Cool. So it's a totally different thing. Early TRL versus late. Average value is this pointed in the right direction versus presenting a catastrophic, preventing a catastrophic failure. I think and they both have mechanics, but they're two different types of mechanical issues. <laughs> definitely. I think... Yeah, that's that helps a ton. It's becoming a theme that we're 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 talking. There's a whole lifespan of the battery. We're talking from BMS on the very early stage and, and right. tools mm -hmm. to improve that all mm -hmm. the way through to the to the end. And maybe that's one of the hardest aspects of this BMS conversation is that it is so wide spanning, right? Um, it's fascinating. 
we have time maybe for one or two more questions in here. Um, there was one at the beginning here that was quite interesting and it is touching back on safety. Somebody asks, can someone comment on standardization for emergency services responding to catastrophic failure of EV batteries as a result of a crash? Because of the diversity of EV technology, firefighters have difficulty finding a standardized approach. Is this something that anyone in this, this team here has, has thought of? Um, yeah, that's a good, good remark, actually. Um, um, it is what we are seeing since we deploy big systems in the field. So what we are seeing is that there's a disparity uh, between the different uh, um, levels of training that different fire departments are receiving in the different regions. Obviously, in areas where there's more EV level deployment, uh, there's more uh, uh, training to the firefighter uh, and emergency response communities than areas where you know evs are not um, uh, you know haven't haven't uh, infused the the market enough uh, there are uh, actually a lot of standards and, and, and best practices and guidelines uh, but if they don't make their way through these departments uh that is a big challenge and you know without going into the the how a city functions but these departments are actually uh, often work very independently from county to county. So if a county doesn't take the initiative to train its firefighters uh, through emergency response for electric vehicles, um, the, you know, that, that's solely on that county's responsibility. Um, well, without going in that direction, the other area is, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 the safety uh, communities like the UL standard, the NIST standards, and other standards can play a big role and do have uh, high voltage training available, as well as uh, a general uh, high voltage battery uh, servicing and training, as well as how to respond to a fire that comes from a battery. Uh, one thing that uh, I know is has been um, is actually uh, required on. Um, commercial vehicles that are uh, more public in nature, such as city buses, for example, uh, there needs to be very clear instructions uh, and markers actually outside the vehicle around where the battery components are. So that way emergency responders uh, don't have to think of, oh, which vehicle model is this? Who was the supplier of the battery? How did they choose to design it? They can really clearly identify where the what we call a mid-pack disconnect is, as well as the emergency shutoff uh, breaker is to you know try to stabilize the system uh, before a fire. Uh, erupts. Yeah, I I think that's that's helpful to understand in, in the level of standardization and training. And then there's another question uh, that sort of touches on safety here, but thinking again into the future, this might be one for for Chichao or uh, maybe even Venkat to comment on, but. Um, you know, solid state batteries are thought to be super safe, no lithium dendrites, long life, bipolar cells. Uh, like, do we still need BMS in that case if we have very safe solid state batteries? Is, does that kind of eclipse this conversation or will there always be a need? I think it will definitely simplify that, but then you will always need a BMS because of temperature balancing and then especially if you have a lot of cells in, in one pack. Um, but just today, um, solid state batteries are still quite far away and then we haven't really seen a solid state battery that can actually deliver high energy density good performance so that is still a couple years away but but yeah um, in principle a safer and more robust cell would definitely significantly simplify the BMS actually can, can I add a comment on that um, uh, with regards to this question, I mean, it's an interesting question because there's been a lot of talk about solid state and solid state being safe and high energy density. We haven't seen that yet. We're still seeing it on the lab scale. So un unless, until it goes into full scale manufacturing and you're making it in the tens of thousands and millions of cells and looking at variability from lot to lot, from cell to cell, I don't think we can minimize the role of the BMS. The BMS is always going to be there. At, to, to just perform basic functions, cell balancing, um, uh, making sure you don't hit your limits, your charge and discharge limits. You also need to control the battery because even if it's a solid state battery, a lithium metal battery, a lithium ion battery, 
every battery in that pack is going to age differently. So you need a BMS to be able, you still need the BMS, you still need intelligence built in and manage how that how that battery is degrading. Agreed. This sort of uh, give me a flashback to, uh, as Mark was talking about clean tech uh, 1.0, uh, I just remember a number of startups talking about, you know, we have batteries that don't need BMSs. Uh, we're a handful of these groups and uh, there's always limits to these batteries, how they can be charged, how they can be discharged, what temperatures and how they operate within them. Um, so you're always going to need a, a BMS, even if it's potentially simplified. Um, and then, yeah, I think I'll just leave, leave yeah. it in there. <laughs> right I, now. I, I, would add I think it's important. Yeah, to, it. yeah. I think it's important to distinguish all solid state and solid state, right? Pretty much everything that's out there right now is solid state with a catalyte, right? So, um, which is which is not really all solid state. So, uh, in that sense, you know, you have a liquid electrolyte. You just have less of it, um, and of course, you may have a ceramic separator that, uh, or other kinds of separators, right? So, I think it's very important to distinguish those two, right, um, between solid state and all solid state. And so, uh, I think uh, for solid state batteries that have catalytes, right, um, I think uh, many of the challenges that are there today. Is BMSs uh, translate and actually maybe um, augment because uh, we don't have that much of an understanding of their or, or as robust an understanding of their failure modes and degradation mechanisms as we do for standard graphite based uh, mm -hmm. graphite based anodes. So I think uh, there's a lot of work that needs to happen in terms of detecting. And, and as Sue said, right here are the list of like mechanism failure mechanisms. I don't think I, you know, I, I teach in my energy storage class and I say, you know, this is this is an evolving topic. I will probably teach you a new lecture uh, next year because it would have evolved from this year to, to next year, right? But you know, the failure modes for graphite, on the other hand, right? I mean, it's now uh, largely etched in stone. So I think uh, I think it's pretty key here in this period that we both innovate on sort of the underlying mechanisms of uh, of the material, but also uh, on the BMS side, trying to detect the failure modes and degradation modes. But, yeah. but Venkat, if, if I may say so, there's there's two parts of this, right? I mean, even if you don't have a safety issue since there's nothing to start on fire, you still, because you have an, an, a valuable asset, you still want to control it so that the performance is optimal and the lifetime is extended. And, you, and even if we were starting to make solid state right now today in mass, it would still take 10 years for that manufacturing variability to be to be down. So I guess what I'm saying is, is we need to, um, the performance aspect of it is still important, even if we don't have safety, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 The heck out of the... Go ahead, would... No, I'll just clarify that it's uh, like you said, the battery management system, I mean, regardless of if the battery is solid state or not solid state, let's assume the safest battery out there. You need a bridge between the electrochemistry and the electrical system. So the battery, the battery management system actually is almost the brain over the electrochemistry because it's doing negotiation with the vehicle and the vehicle controller. So I, I love the question actually, and could, could we slash out all this electronics uh, and reduce costs? Uh, due to the nature of the system, you need uh, to bridge between the physics of electrochemistry with the physics of electrical motors, <laughs> they're going to need that battery management system. Okay. Additionally, uh, uh, you know, today's cells, they have additives that protects them during overcharge. But you can't rely on that additive because it's going to get consumed and then the cell is going to go into an overcharge mode. So you need a, an electronic system that will detect and stop the charge. Similarly, for a solid state battery, you, you need the battery management system to actually protect the battery from itself, uh, if I may put it that way. And then the twist I would add is, could we use battery management system and novel algorithms or, or, or certain methods to actually enable something that is, let's say, less from ideal, with no compromise to safety, but bring it to a more uh, utilizable state? So for example, you have a new battery, everything's great about it, except that it has a very high self-discharge rate and a certain band. Okay, then can I put a battery management system that prevents this battery from floating too much in that destructive band? And as a result, I enhance the capability of this battery and its throughput. So therefore the battery management system actually is enabling the electrochemistry. This is just another yeah. way of looking at it. 
this this also makes me think of Mark uh, Vandenberg's comment of the battery management system being more than the brain about the battery and and focusing on you know controlling electrons and, and the electrochemistry, but even thinking about the system level control of the vehicle or, or the asset that the battery is in, right? I think that that resonates for sure. Excellent. Well, I think if there are no more thoughts on this one, that might be a good question to close out on. Um, we have certainly had a wide ranging discussion and uh, we are now at the tail end of, of the panel and of this session. Um, I, I would love to give a huge thank you to all of the panelists who joined us today. Uh, if we could do a virtual round of applause, I think we would all love to do that. Um, truly, thank you. This was, this was really engaging. Um, it's been an amazing session, and I think we're all leaving a little bit smarter uh, and a little bit more excited about the future of energy than we were when we came in. Um, so with that being said, uh, I want to thank the awesome audience as well for joining us. I think it was really wonderful to get so much engagement uh, from, from everybody joining the session today. Uh, and uh, so thank you to all who joined. I think if we can move to the next slide. Uh, now is a chance. So we've had this engaging discussion today. Um, if you'd like to stay involved and stay kind of in the conversation around energy transformation and EX, we do encourage you to join our LinkedIn community or our WeChat community. You can follow the QR codes on the screen here and uh, the conversation can continue both throughout the next sessions uh, in, uh, in, in the coming Energy Week uh, program or even beyond that. Next slide, please. So tomorrow we'll be really excited to bring in another panel of uh, esteemed experts focused on charging safety and grid technology. So that's something truly to look forward to. Uh, this is a sneak peek into who will be joining. So uh, maybe even some folks that people on this panel uh, know already. Uh, so please do feel free to, uh, to join us for tomorrow's session. If we go to the next slide, I'll have a QR code for everybody joining in the audience to go ahead and sign up for, uh, for that session on Wednesday. It'll start at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Again, focus on charging, charging safety and grid technology. Uh, we would also love to extend a huge debt of gratitude to all of our sponsors and partners and supporters who helped get the word out about Energy Week 2021. Uh, they're in the lower left there, and if you haven't uh, if you haven't come across those communities or given them some love in the past, please do go check them out. Um, they really have helped us kind of gather everybody for for these uh, these wonderful events. And I will leave off with the final note that uh, if you'd like to share about Energy Week, please do feel free to use the hashtag Energy2021 to post things on LinkedIn. Uh, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear more engagement. And uh, I, I'll, at the risk of repeating myself multiple times, I'd love to give a huge thank you again to all of our guests and panel in the panel, as well as our whole audience. And we do hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much, everybody.